Hello and welcome to the latest edition of the Gold, Goats, and Guns podcast. My name is Tom Luongo. I hope you're all having a great day because today I've got part two of my interview I did with Lee Stranahan uh, a couple of weeks ago. We should uh, get right to it. Lee Stranahan is an investigative reporter and host of the radio show Fault Lines on Sputnik Radio. Uh, he's a great guy and this is a really interesting talk. We go in some very interesting directions here. So we'll pick it up right where we left off the last time. So if if they came in tomorrow and said, you have to do this at Sputnik, I just quit. And I, I like the money and I like the insurance, but you know what? I've lived in my car <laughs> and uh, I just like whatever. I, I, I'll survive. I'm not worried about it. So right. I, I my my career, no nothing is worth more than my ability to tell the truth. And as soon as someone tries to take it away from me, I'm gone. I don't care how much they're paying me. Yeah, well, that's, it has to be that way because ultimately, again, authenticity is what's going to sell in this marketplace. I mean, I, I look at, you know, part of me always like has to think about it in, in the economic terms because really, you know, kind of an economist first and all that stuff first and then all the political philosophy and everything else second. And I look at it and I say, you know, what's your unique selling proposition? Well, I speak the truth. And the minute you, 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 you puncture that, the minute you puncture that mythology, the, it's all over. You know, when, the minute you break that trust, this is why Facebook is done, Lee. Yeah. They've broken the public trust, right? This is why Tesla is done. They've broken the public trust, okay? And the the, the free market's pretty brutal about this. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. You, you, you have to be... You have to be willing at every level to just be as authentic, authentic as you can be. This is why Hillary lost. You know, I said it from the BNA. I called it the authenticity gap. I said, I, and I called this back in March of 2016. I said, there's no way she's going to win against Donald Trump if Donald, because everybody knows who Donald Trump is. He's not putting on airs. You know, I mean, right. no, there right. may be exactly. some acting there, but he's, but you know, but at the end of the day, Trump is Trump because he's been in the public spotlight since, I don't know. I grew up with Donald Trump. He's like, you know, Star Wars and Donald Trump are like, you know, I mean, it's like, it's like, I grew up in New York for Christ's sake. That's right. Donald Trump. Yeah, you right, know? right, right. So, no, exactly. Yeah, no, no, right. So, you know, you know what you're getting. Yeah. Right. So the, there was never any, there was never any doubt that Trump was going to sell just on that alone. All he had to do was keep that running. All he had to do was keep playing that playbook. That's why he won the election when he said, because you'd be in jail. Because that was a, that was a pure moment of Trump being honest, of, see, of seizing the opportunity. She, she stepped in it so hard and then waited for the, the applause moment. And he just crushed it by, by popping right in there. And you know that was instinctual because that's exactly who he was. And he won the election with those five words. Well, what I, what I, you know, here's the thing. Just in the sweep of history – you you need you needed a Trump as a transitional person right. in, in that thing that I said going from kings and billionaires controlling the information and uh, communications means of production that's over right mm -hmm. that's over and uh, uh, and the old the old era and the new era Trump is a transitional right. figure. You and he's his, he, he's he's there. He's our Loki figure. He's our he's our we have the Strauss and Howe, the guys who wrote the fourth turning, call it the the great champion. Uh, I like to just call Trump Loki. Uh, he's the guy to tear it all down. And you needed you needed somebody who had a hundred percent name recognition in the country because you're up against Hillary Clinton, who's got a hundred percent name recognition. You needed right. somebody who's not a millionaire or not a ten millionaire, but a billionaire who could. Yep. Who could lose a lot of money, which he did, and still be like, okay, I'm keeping the golf courses. You know what I mean? Like, not right. like have to to do that. And Trump was that guy, and he and he also had to, and he also had to have a certain level of narcissism, yes, and a certain level of sleaziness that the Alinsky tactics wouldn't work. That's that's I've right. I've been saying, I've been saying for a while. I mean, Trump is better at Alinsky than they are. Yeah. And he's the only one that he showed us how to stop the he show, he's given the Republicans spine because they normally just fold under Alinsky style tactics because they have too much shame. They have they have a sense of decency and sense of shame. Generally speaking, this, these old white guys in the Republican Party and the and the and the kind of the core of the Republican Party base does as well. It's why the nuts and sluts thing works so well. Right. But Trump is gotten this past that or gotten you know, most people past that to say, no, 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 this is just a tactic. And it doesn't work because he doesn't have any shame. He doesn't care. And no one believes that. I mean, other, other than the hardest of hardcore Democrats believe anything in the Steele dossier. 
right? Well, then none of them believe that, you know, he was in a Moscow hotel room pissing on a hooker. Right. Please. Right. right. I mean, you know, come on, play, pull the other leg, plays Jingle Bells. I mean, now they believe that he, that, you know, he sat, sat around and, you know, talked like a, uh, talked like a dude in the locker room. Yeah. Sure. And had, yeah, and had affairs and everything else. That right. stuff. And, 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 does, yeah. and does anybody care? No. No, of course not. Did it, I, I did I like him for that reason? No, I didn't. I voted for him because I wanted. I didn't want. I didn't want Hillary Clinton as president. And two, I'm like, no, I want that guy in the White House because if he's yeah. half the patriot he says he is, I'm good. And this, the interesting part about Trump is that he's actually governing like a president and not like a king. If I've said this before and I mean it, if Donald Trump, if 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 I could sit down with for an hour, maybe a half hour, but an hour with Trump and go over just the Browder thing. He would get it instantly, and a lot of people would be out of a job the next day. And I mm-hmm. really believe that because he would he would understand the implications of the game that Browder's playing. It, it, it for instance, Stephen Mnuchin, the connection right. to Stephen Mnuchin at Treasury, and he would mm-hmm. see the problems that have been created by the Magnitsky Act and that by Bill Browder propagating the Magnitsky Act around the world. So now. Right. That standard can be applied against U.S. citizens. I'm going to say that again. The standard is now can be applied. See, the idea of the Magnitsky Act is sanctions against foreigners, right? So you and I should be safe, right? But when Canada passes the Magnitsky Act, that now means if Canada wants to ban you from coming into the country and seize any money or whatever you have in Canada, right? they have the ability to do that to the Magnitsky Act. And you don't have to have done anything except be on a list that someone gives them. With the Magnitsky Act, people have to understand that there is not like if the UN Security Council, forget whether you think they're valid or not, at least that's a standard, right? right? Or if Interpol or if the CIA in a secret of a, there's no, there's literally not any standard at all. It's a list of names people Bill Browder gave to them. That's what it is. Mm-hmm. That's there's no standard. So just think about that. What? If, if, I know. I mean, well, they're using it in the EU to try and stifle any um, any investigation into Browder's offshore dealings in Cyprus. Right. That, that's Get the right. The EU trying to tell Cyprus that they're going to invoke Article Seven against Cyprus for invest for allowing Russia to to. Act constitutionally and yes. investigate Bill Browder. That's that's what it's insane. This is where this is where Lucy Commissar's work is so because when you get get down, a lot of this involves the offshore banking system. Right. At, at the end of the day, you can't really fully understand the story till you get into that aspect of it, and that's deep stuff. But Trump's a guy who because I he gets the offshore banking system, I think. Of course he does. But he's not a guy who's and people criticize Trump as a billionaire, blah blah blah. He's not the kind of guy who's there's there's people who make things, right? And there's people who make who strictly make money off of money. And a guy like Browder's only ever made money off of money. And right. he's never built a thing in his life, right? And nope. they figure and and even the people who make money out of money there's people who learn to do it legit and people who learn these little schemes and this whole transfer pricing scheme thing that Browder does and that Kordakovsky does and that, you know, people, Americans like the Dark Brothers or Paul Singer do, right? Yes. It's the same. It's the same game. And it's funny that they all end up in business with each other at some point. And it's funny that, it that Paul Singer's the guy who was paying for the first anti-Trump dossier that became the Steele dossier. That was right. pa- Paul Singer paying for that. Right. right. So the so, ultimate vulture capitalist who's been who's who's who still is trying to destroy Argentina. And and th- what I'm saying is these vulture capitalists, a term that most Americans do not know. And if they knew it and understood it, 99 percent of them would think it's horrible. Right. Right. Period. But that's who's behind this. These vulture capitalists who are just making life miserable for citizens and profiting from it so they can go to Aspen and Davos, right? That right. they are the ones who are the most scared to death and they have connections in government. And blah, blah. By the way, Soros is in that pack. You know, like and so, right. and so uh, they see this stuff crumbling. But I swear to right. God, if I get the info to Trump, and I'm working on it, I'm working on it. Right. That's 
that's part of that's the big the long game plan is I think if he saw it he'd go he would understand why Mnuchin has been in business with Soros is the wrong guy to have a treasury because so much of this stuff the Magnitsky Act has to be renewed by treasury every year right so all you need is a treasury secretary to go wait what is this it says right in the Magnitsky Act to protect American investors of Yukos oil what's this about because it does by the way right the Magnitsky Act is about protecting American investors if that's what it says go read it uh that's what the game's about, right? The game wasn't about human rights violations and sanctioning oligarchs. It's about no. they were trying to profit. They were trying to pillage Russia's resources after the commies fell, right? And 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 I'm sure that I, I'm sure that part of the reason why they were so scared of Trump and Putin meeting behind closed doors, yes, is that Putin was probably telling them most of this stuff. Yes, that's right. But uh, you know, I'm I'm almost positive of that, right? But oh, I'm sure that Putin doesn't know all of it either. No, he doesn't. And whenever there's a communications thing that makes it trickier, and it's a tough subject matter, that's why mm -hmm. I really feel like, well, I know the subject better. I, and by the way, here's what's frustrating: a lot of the stuff I knew a year ago. And don't forget, I worked at Breitbart, and I know Steve Bannon, and blah blah blah, and I know Seb Gorka, and I saw what was happening very early. And I'm like, look, I, the president needs to know. And this is before the Browder stuff, but there was other aspects of stuff that like, okay, he needs to know this. The Ukraine thing, for instance, right? And I tried to get to Bannon and Gorka, and I did get to them, and they just didn't want to hear it. And I'm like, you could have saved it. But when Bannon was at the White House, I was trying to be like, this Ukrainian thing's a big deal. And all someone needs to do is find this guy, because I was talking to the whistleblower but he didn't want to be public at the time. This is a, right. this a year ago. But I said, he'll talk to you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like right. nothing. They could have ended this Russia witch hunt thing a year ago because the fact is Donald Trump has the one thing the media can't stop, which is the bully pulpit. If he comes out and does a press conference, every camera in the world is on him, right? Period. Yep. He's the only guy who can do that. A senator can hold a press conference. I don't care who it is. People might not cover it. The president comes out and does a press conference. Every camera in the world's on him, right? So if what that means is if the press secretary and the president understand what's going on with the Ukraine thing, if they hammer on it day after day after day after day after day after day, it becomes the news cycle. They're not going to want right. to cover it at first, not the second day, not the third day, but about the ninth day. <laughs> Of the right. Well, and, and moreover, once it becomes a, a story that once containment has been breached, then they can't not cover it eventually. That's they can right. all collude amongst themselves for a little while, but eventually someone has to break because otherwise they will lose in the competitive marketplace. And this is simply Andrew Breitbart tactics, what he used to call drip, drip, drip. It's what he do with the O'Keefe videos on Acorn. Right. And Andrew knew exactly what he was doing. He and I talked about it because, see, you know, I've been doing journalism for a couple of years when I met Andrew. And I'd, I'd covered some big stories and like the Edwards affair thing. That was a big mm -hmm. national story. And uh, and Andrew saw, even though I was a Democrat at the time, I was fair about it. Not just fair. I exposed Edwards because it was such an obvious lie when the rest of the media was avoiding it. No right. one wanted to talk about it. And he and I used to talk about how do you break a story the media doesn't want to cover? It's always tricky. The way you do it is drip, drip, drip. It works. O'Keefe still does it. Drip, 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 right? Mm -hmm. And uh, right. Trump has the ability to do that and not be ignored. If he just, if you, if if they were hammering at the Ukraine thing, you, then you start to create news. What happens is you start to create news events because if they're up there saying we're investigating Charlie, we're calling for an investigation of Ambassador Charlie who ordered this to happen. He's the ambassador, still the ambassador, right? All that happens is about day mm -hmm. three, Charlie starts. This is why Soros understanding reflexivity works. You see, this is why he's a genius. Because Soros reflexivity, what, what you're doing with the drip, drip, drip is you're creating something that then creates something else. Now Charlie responds. I am outraged by these accusations mm -hmm. against me and I'm going to fight them. Now you respond to his response. And so it goes for a few days. Until something starts to break. You could see that with the Anthony Weiner story. I can name a hundred stories 
Yep. But that are that are well. Yeah, it's not, it, Wiener is something I was going to break. I was going to bring up. Trump did. Trump was the one who brought Anthony Wiener to the table by by bringing him up to like remind everybody who Huma Abedin is married to and Hillary Clinton. I mean, I remember when he started doing that. He because he tweeted about it like, you know, I don't know, a month or two before the story broke. And, and I remember sitting there chatting with a friend of mine about it. And he's like, God, Trump is brilliant. Look at what he's doing. Well, so I worked. I worked in the Anthony Wiener story extensively. And I, I probably, I would argue I know more about whom Abedin than anyone in the world co- covering her, which is why I goes for that piece for Roger. Uh, uh, I mm-hmm. was involved from about two hours in the Wiener story because Andrew was on vacation with his wife. He told his wife, who's, I, it was Memorial Day weekend. I swear, honey, I'm not going to look at the news. This starts to break. So Andrew calls me. So he's having me do research for him. And try to communicate with the person who'd expose this. And uh, so on that Wiener story, I was like, I knew the photos were coming and I was working, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I, I, I know it's sort of really, really well, including the stuff people forget. Like in that first go round of the Wiener story, there was a 17 year old girl he was talking about. Now everyone knows he likes the younger ladies. Uh, but at the time, this is in the first story and that just got memory hold people forgot that but uh, i worked that angle of the story I was talking to a reporter who was in the house of the 17 year old when the police came to get the computer stuff like that so mm-hmm. um this drip 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 method trump can do it he's got the ability to do it the great thing about having a big platform see breitbart could do it but they're pussies so they can't actually do it they right. the, what the thing that andrew had is he he gave Zero fucks. So Andrew would just do it. And it used to drive the people around him nuts. But he right. was right. And he would push things. And it reminds me of Trump in a lot of ways. And uh, But Andrew would, would, would just push the story. Big platforms could do it. Breitbart could do it, but they don't. The caller could do it, kind of. But they don't really have the thing. Uh, Infowars could do it, but Alex goes in too many directions. Alex is really brilliant in a lot of areas. That guy's really brilliant. Oh, yeah, he is. He really knows stuff on a very deep level. And to people who don't understand who Carol Quigley is, sometimes it sounds like he's babbling like an insane person. But all that shows is their lack of scholarship, which is understandable Mm -hmm. in our society. But they don't know why he's going on about... You know uh, this. You know Council on Foreign Relations and right. Carol Quigley, and he talks so fast that if you don't know what he's, if you know what he's talking about, you go, "Yep, I know what yep. he's talking about." I would, I would have a drink of water before I explained it, but okay. <laughs> but, 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 but you know what I'm saying. But to, but to people on the outside, it's like he's just nuts, just right. Insane because well, he's so because he's so far beyond their frame of reference. That's and I get the yes. same. I I, yes. I I get the same thing, Lee. I, it happens to me all the time, dude. I've been ranting to this to my at, at, you know before I started doing this publicly. I've been doing this stuff for twelve years. As Camille and I were talking about this yesterday, and I and most of my own friends are libs because I live in outside of Gainesville, Florida. It's like Lib Central. Yeah, and college, show. and you know we all we all grew up in college together for Christ's sake. So you know. At one point, I was vaguely liberal, kind of, sort of. I just really was apolitical. And then I and then I took the world's most political quiz and went, oh, I'm a libertarian. That makes right. so much more sense now. Right? I went, oh, no wonder I'm this way. But I would yell – I would tell these people what's happening, what's going on, like like Syria or the Ukraine or any of this stuff. And we would argue it like you know, cigars in hand, whiskey in – cigar in one hand, whiskey in the other at my daughter's birthday party. We're on the back porch doing what we do, men sitting around talking politics, drinking and smoking. And I'm explaining this stuff, and they're all like, "No, that's not what's going on." Blah blah blah. blah. Putin's a thief. Putin's. I'm like, "Yeah, where did you get that information?" I couldn't, didn't have the word Bill Browder on my lips at that point, but I wish I did. I'm like, no. And they would just look at me like I had four heads. And I'm like, "Dudes, you're just missing it." And every day, every time, I wound up being right. I wound up being right. I wound up being right. Not about everything. Not certainly about the timing, about certain things. But at the end of the day, Camille even said this to me yesterday. She's like, or the other day, she said, "My wife." She said. Okay, so you were ranting about Soros like with Occupy Wall Street back in you know two thousand eight. I'm like, yeah, and, she, and like, and that turns out to be right. I'm like, yeah, exactly. But you know, I just tuned you out back then because yeah, it's just Tom. <laughs> He's just kind of, you know. Well, see, I had so, a, I had a weird background. Know. So, I, so I was a teenage libertarian, and right. 
So I have my libertarian cred. I'll do it in I'll do it in three steps, which is I was a volunteer. It sounds like a, it sounds like a 50s B movie. I was a teenage libertarian. It does, but it's true. But uh, but I was a volunteer in the Clark campaign in '80. Sure. So uh, I I went to Ayn Rand's funeral, and right. Neil Parrott, the drummer from Rush, has thrown me off his lawn. And if you're a certain kind of libertarian, the Neil Parrott reference makes perfect sense. If right. you're a big fan of 2112, but mm-hmm. uh, but but I and I went to an objectivist high school and blah blah blah. So I knew. Uh, and I audio taped one of Leonard, Leonard Peikoff's lecture courses and blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. So I was really involved with the objectivist right after. Well, those people I don't have I don't have a lot of use for. So well, no, me, I'm not one of those libertarians. Me, me neither. But I was a libertarian first. For I, it was for me, right. it was Robert Ringer's book. The the thing you got the the thing that got me into it is was Robert Ringer, and that that led to re, le, getting into the canon, you know, the right. Hayek and von Mises and and right. and all that Lots stuff. And right. that, and, and, and Rothbard, and, and that th- I'd gone to libertarian bookstores that were like in New York at the time. And I mm-hmm. used to go in San Francisco to, uh, uh, who's the big laissez faire? Uh, laissez faire books, yeah. Yeah, I used to like visit laissez faire when I go to San Francisco when I was, uh, in my early, early 20s, late teens. And, uh, the, the, I, and then I saw so much of the infighting with the objectivists. And I found out, I got really disillusioned with objectivism, not as a philosophy, to some extent to a philosophy, but just the personalities and the people involved and the affairs and backstabbing and lying and all the weird stuff. You know what I mean? Right. And there was yeah, a, yeah. There's a lot of it. And, uh, oh, yeah. And uh, so I just got out of that for everything. I didn't get political and, you know, for a long time. And then... And then I started to get political again, and you know, I, libertarians. So I know libertarian theory. Like I, I understand the libertarian movement. I, I think as well as most libertarians I know, uh, mm-hmm. and better, better than a lot of them. And, yes. And, and, so I've thought about it. I wrote a piece at HuffPost. I think ten years ago. It's like literally ten years ago today, or, or I mean, like. Was, forgive me. When I read it on the show, it, it was like almost to the day. So I think it was 10 years ago, but it could have been eight years ago about my vision of the third party movement. And it's it's held up to me to this day, which is, I said, the problem with the libertarians and the greens are there at sort of the edges of the ideological spectrum. Sure. If you look at the world a certain way, the way I would describe it now is if you look at it as uh uh, left, right, let's say that's a val- that's one way to look at it. Libertarians look at it as as freedom versus statism. That's another way to look at it. But these are all frames you put on things, right? Right. And so, to me, the big frame now is elitism versus populism, and mm-hmm. it's a it it doesn't correspond to left, right, but it. But there's, you know, areas of large convergence. Hey, hey, well, it's like I, I still like I like the Nolan chart is one of my favorite ways of just still looking at it, where you have you know libertarianism at the top, authoritarianism, authoritarianism at the bottom, and then you know the classic left kind of communists on one side and 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 conservatives on the other side, and, and so and and the, you know there was a friend of mine as my first uh, roommate in college used to say, who was a conservative, said, you know, the libertarians are proof positive that the uh, political spectrum is a circle, not a line, right? Yeah. And, and I, that, I would argue that it's a it's a sphere, because if you add the other yeah. aspect of elitism yes. versus populism. Fair enough. Fair th- enough. Then it creates so, a really interesting vectors, you know? Yes, it does. And I think that, but I think that elitism, elitism versus populism is, is a symptom of the kind of the, where we are in the generational cycle, right? And, um, you know, I start getting into like the fourth turning stuff and, and we get into that, you know, and, and, and the fact that we are reaching the end of a generational cycle, the 85 year, you call it a contrariety of winter, call it the four, fourth turning, call it whatever you want. There's a, there's something to, there's an 85, a, a, approximately an 85 year cycle, which uh, corresponds roughly with the lifespan of a human being and the four stages of life and everything else. And I think we're in that stage now, and this is the chaos. This is the breakdown period. This is the chaos period where, um, society is breaking down, and so populism is a is a uh, is a natural reaction against a, a sclerotic, tyrannical institutional order, which is what we have: the EU, the United States, all of them, right? And they're all it, it, this this 
and it's become sclerotic and it's become uh, tyrannical. Jordan, this is why Jordan Peterson is now resonating with people so hard because he's properly explaining what's happening to the world at a kind of mythological level. It makes all this stuff makes perfect sense, right? And and the natural reaction now is in the opposite direction. We've lived under Marxism as the dominant political paradigm for the last cycle, if not cycle and a half. And that's ending. And now the internal and the internal um, inconsistencies of it are being exposed. So now the real question is what's going to happen in the breakdown. Now, the, as a libertarian, I look at things on the big long term timeline, right? I, as, a, as a stock analyst, I will look at daily charts, weekly charts, monthly charts, quarterly charts, annual charts, decade long charts, right? Where each bar is you know, one of those um, is, is one of those time periods. And so you have to look at time in a fractal sense, right? And as you do that, as you unpack things that way and you, you start to look at it, look at things that way and you start to look at human behavior that way. And I say this all the time, you know, a couple of thousand years ago, not even that, even not that long ago, we were sacrificing people to the sun god. And today we're arguing about very niggling edge cases of individual um, where individual uh, rights um, are subordinate to, to communal rights. I mean, these ideas are very young and we're. We're, we're progressing very quickly along that timeline towards autonomous liberty. It's going to take us a while. The forces of decentralization have to fight against the forces of centralization. And all the people that we've talked about in nasty terms here this morning, the Soros's and the Steyer's and the rest of them, um, they're all part of the old sclerotic system. Well, so let me. And that's and that system is and that system is breaking down. And the next cycle is going to be we're going to we, human beings are going to move towards the quote unquote libertarian ideal. We may never reach it, but we're moving in the direction of individual liberty. Just it's going to be in fits and starts. And it's going to be a cyclical thing where we're moving, you know, we're moving in a in, a, in an upwards upwardly sloping sine wave effectively so, over time. So my my argument is that we're in a fundamentally. This goes back to that iPhone thing that I said, the 10 year thing. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is, is that forget all that stuff about 85 year cycles. That's, that's done because we're at a point right now where Moore's law is literally broken. Moore's law, oh, yeah. no, Moore's law no longer applies. And so what's happened is think about the world we live in and the technology surrounding us and the fact that there's still a queen in England. Let's just stop. Let's just hold up right. For, for right there. What happened was, <laughs> let's just hold up right there. Why is no one going, what the fuck, are you a queen? No, you're not. Of what? No, you're not. We'll make sure you have a great retirement, a fantastic requirement. But this whole, like, you have palaces because but because you're part of the bloodline of, no, 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 no. We're <laughs> modern. We don't do that. And, and you could do it in Saudi Arabia and everything else. What's happened, and you could do it to the Catholic Church. What's happening is... Uh, the cycle used to be big institutions, you had to rely on them, and you did, and that your reliance and your compliance was largely based on your ignorance. In other words, if 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 priests were hmm. getting with little boys in in Switzerland, uh, and you're living in Nebraska, you'd never know about it in, you know, 50, 1950, right? Why would you know about that? Why would that come up, right? right. And that means if you didn't know that the Swiss guy was transferred to the Omaha parish, Right. You wouldn't know that there was a problem. Now what's happened is our communication is so quick that scandals can literally break on Twitter and be around the world in a half hour. And you or I could start that if we if I'm walking down the street and a meteor falls or whatever, boom, and I catch with my, the camera I'm walking around with at all times, like all people are now. Uh, if I catch that, that becomes the top story in the world. What's happened is, as people have been able to learn more about institutions, they don't trust any of them. They're all corrupt. Right. Business is corrupt, and religion is corrupt, and government's corrupt, and they're all corrupt. And the the ironic thing is, now technology has given us the tools to have transparency. You could, mm -hmm. it's actually technically feasible. It wasn't technically feasible to see every political donation go on a big board that, you know, that flips. That right. wouldn't have been possible. Now that's, you know, you could get an Indian to write that app for you for 50 bucks. And, uh, and so, uh, 
Uh, oh yeah, and all that's going to do is accelerate some of these. It's going to accelerate some of this stuff. But I but think it. Ch- I think it changed it, and I think the people. Who- oh yeah, I think I think it may change the direct. It may change the slope of the of the uh, of the upward cycle. Yeah. Right. Uh, the, the, yeah. I'm talking about that's the the cycle. Right. The, the the slope of that cycle that may that may accelerate upwards, and I and I would be happy for that to happen. Because we've been, you know, I think up until like 1800 or so, Gary North used to write about this stuff all the time, who brings something else into you, which is, here's one for you, that up until about 1800 or so, the, the world's real GDP growth, for lack of a better term, compounded wealth at about a 1% per annum rate. And then something shifted in the early 1800s. And he used to talk about this all the time and say, I don't know what it is, because I haven't been able to figure it out yet. And anybody who can figure it out, you should write a book about it, that it started, that it doubled into about a 2% rate. Right. And I have my own theory about what it is, but it doesn't really matter. And that 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 was an acceleration. Now we add in this ability to break down um, to to communicate in in literally real time around the world um, is breaking is accelerating the, the value stream, the ability for humans to be productive if they choose to be. Far at far greater uh, rates than they ever were before, and are we going to see another doubling? Well, because is it because is is this because is government effectively just process loss? This is the way I view it, right? I view it as you know kind of a as like societal friction. It's like the, it, all the barriers to people actually getting what they want out of the world and what they want out of their lives is it's it's all the rent seekers either through government institutions right, or even right. private institutions. It's all that's all just process loss. We start removing more and more process loss from the system. We stop sending 70% of the electricity that we generate to ground. We stop producing you know, shirts in in Vietnam when we can have uh, a 3D printer literally create us a suit on demand at, around the corner. Why do we need to do why do we need to do this? You know, all of this thing and then shred 75% of the clothes that we produce. All of this stuff is coming. All of these changes, fundamental changes to the supply chain and how we manage commodities and everything. It's all coming in the next in the next cycle. Well, it's, you but, you mentioned rent seeking. You know, that's a term I heard from a, a guy I'm or probably, I'm friendly enough with, I guess we're friends, but I mean I call him Eric Weinstein who's with uh, Teal Capital. Right. Eric's a freaking brilliant guy, man. That dude's mm-hmm. really smart. And he was interested in, you know, we've had talks about stuff, but I heard the term rent seeking from him. And uh, he he talked about, I was talking to him about some of the things I, I think about stuff. And he sort of probably was like, my concern here is, he said, I'm not saying you're wrong, but what if you're right and it destroys the world? And I, and when Eric Weinstein says that to you, you kind of go, well, let me think about that. And, right. um Here's what it is, and I don't. There's nothing even controversial here. Let me let me let me break out a cultural reference. I think it's I, I've talked about this before. It's significant that the uh, modern political movement, the Trump movement, makes a lot of use of memes from two films from 1999, uh, The Matrix and Fight mm-hmm. Club. Okay, yep. you hear the term "red pill," for instance, comes from The Matrix. Uh, right. The, the uh, Seth Rich thing, his name is Seth Rich. That comes from Fight yes. Club, right? Yep. And I could name reference after reference. Both of those films are sort of the same story, which is mm-hmm. dude living a humdrum average life suddenly realizes that there's this other world and that the life he's living has been a lie, right? And mm-hmm. And so they go very different directions plot wise and and right. setting and everything else but thematically that's what those films are about okay yes that's this gnawing sense that people have that here's what it is i said there's still kings yes and there's still these big institutions like the cia and the military industrial complex and people like soros and all of them and the fact is if people woke up <laughs> And they are. That's what's scaring them. And said, wait a minute. What are you doing with this offshore? Wait. You're, wait. The, the, right. You're transferring. Oh, yeah, no, that's, this, is exactly the, this is exactly the thing. Lee, yeah. back in 2008, political trajectory of the United States changed when Ron Paul stood up to Rudy Giuliani and said no. Yeah. Everything changed in that moment. I emailed Lou Rockwell the next morning. I was watching the replay. I was at work. I emailed him the next morning and said, Lou. This is tell Ron to get get ready for a deluge of money and that everything is going to change for him. 
Yeah. Because he just woke the world up because Giuliani attacked down. You never attack down in politics ever. It'll, you have nothing to gain yeah. from it. And Giuliani lost his political career because that was the spark that set off the that set off the populist spark here in the, uh, the fire in the United States. And we saw we saw it from the left and the right. It started on the right with Ron Paul, but he was uniting the he was uniting the uh, the, the, the the millennials. In who already saw all of this stuff. So, you know, think about think about all those guys like Ed Norton in Fight Club. Now give them a purpose. Right. Yeah, now those exactly. guys are all getting now those guys are all getting taught how to be men from Jordan Peterson. Right. Jordan Peterson brought up the other day a really good point. My wife brought up to me. He said, Peterson's like, look at what's happening to to young white men in in, in colleges. They're being marginalized, they're being stepped on, they're being shit on, all of this stuff. And guess what? It's going to make them stronger. The ones who survive it will be Randy and superheroes who will remake freaking society because they will have everything thrown at them and they still survived it. Imagine that. It may not be you know a high high number of them. It only takes one percent of them probably to be the app to to be that the, you're bre- you're breeding neos left and right. You're breeding Luke Skywalker's. You're breeding Harry Potter's left and right. Well, These are timeless stories in, in that respect so well and i i also think that the lid is that's why i say like that if if as many people knew who kordakovsky is as knew who story daniels is the mm-hmm. world's different right because right because once you understand and and it's proof once you go through the the election just go to open secrets and you go oh, look that's kordakovsky's lobbying money going to the people behind distributing the seal dossier to the fbi huh what do you know? Um, Why am I shocked about that? Not, none of this stuff is like, you don't have a lot, so much of it you don't have to guess. It's in public record and it's just what they're trying to do. Once you understand right. it, you just go, well, this really does affect a lot of things. Like I say, the problem with Browder is, uh, the, the problem I've had is, how do you deal with a scandal that involves almost every single member of Congress? Because they all voted for the Magnitsky Act. Right. Right. So if it's if it's just if it's a partisan issue, the Democrats got that one wrong or the Republicans. How do you get 90? How do you get 99 senators to admit they made a mistake? That's impossible, I would argue. Right. So how do you step it down so that you maybe get 51 percent saying the 48 made a mistake or whatever? You see what I'm saying? And Mm -hmm. and. That's what I'm saying. I this 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 thing with Kavanaugh. I'm sort of back to partisanship because uh, I believe the Democrats are that bad. They've actually endangered democracy. They pushed us closer to a nuclear oh, yeah. war for their own political ambitions, and they don't stand for anything. They literally no, they don't. They, they 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 are now nihilism. As we as a yeah. as a friend of mine quotes to me in my live streams all the time. Say what you want about national socialism, dude. At least it was an ethos. Yeah, no. The quote from the Big Lebowski, right? They don't believe in anything. Yeah, and and I like I can't wait to. I need to use that line as a tagline for for a, a blog post. It's just that it hasn't one hasn't presented itself yet, but because it's it's so it's such great dialogue and it's, it's and it's, it's it's such great stuff. But you're right, and they don't stand for anything, and it and, and we want our. This is the thing that really bothers me. Which is so obvious now. George Soros has made it, has said that his life's mission is to destroy the United States. That's why Kavanaugh had to win because he was literally trying to destroy the political process here in Washington. Yeah, and not that I want it to survive. As a libertarian, I want those systems broken down, but I do not want them broken down in the most egregious way imaginable. That then allows for the worst kind of tyranny. And chaos. I don't want that kind of chaotic breakdown. It's got to be done. We used to call it the libertarian Hippocratic oath. You got to. You got to improve these systems and reform them and do as little harm as possible. And that's the tricky part. And, you know, beating Feinstein here, beating Soros here and making him waste 50 million or 100 million dollars on this. It's why I think Putin is so brilliant and not responding to every provocation because he's doing it on purpose. He understands what in, in Russia, for example, he understands that he's winning by doing nothing. He's winning by allowing us to continue to um, expend energy that we cannot afford to sustain expending. And eventually he will wear us down while he slowly but surely remakes the Russian economy and the Russian society from within. 
um, yeah, no, and no. allows the natural processes to strengthen themselves and allow Russian society to strengthen itself over the course of generations. Um, so that's what's happening. That's what's going on here. And um, that's why I have faith that Putin is on the right path. And it's why I have faith in, this, in some ways that Trump is allowing certain things to happen because he understands that every time they do something like this, they're actually just committing their own, they're, they're just slitting their own throats. They're committing political suicide by doing all of this because we can see them now. Yeah, no, that's, that's right. And the, and the problem is they don't, uh, the, if you're on the other hand, and I talked to my ex-wife last night, who's a, mm-hmm. who's a resistancy person. Sure. And she just, I, I brought up things like the McLean letter, like the, the boyfriend letter mentioning McLean. Right. No, never heard of it. No idea. Never, nothing. Didn't cross the radar. And that's why it's been interesting doing the show this week. Doing the news has been interesting because I have made a very conscious effort to report the headlines that I think are the actual headlines, not what the media is saying that they are. In other words, right. that right. while, while I, and I've been saying all, I was saying all week, while Christine Blasey Ford's story continues to fall apart, nobody else was saying, was reporting that. When you turn on NPR, it was it was all like Democrats call for whatever, right? And I was just like, I'm not going to play their game this week. I am going to write the news headlines. Here's what's happening. Her story's breaking down. If her story wasn't breaking down, I would report that and I would view it differently. Because I thought the Roy Moore accusation when the when the Roy Moore accusation when I first heard about it and first read about it. I said this is a well-reported story with a valid accusation that it seems to me they'd done, a, they'd done their homework and there was a lot of detail in there. And I, was, I looked for things like falsifiability. I looked for mm-hmm. how did they say the meeting happened, what, and it was all like boom. Uh, and, then, and then eventually I'm more convinced than ever because I think I understand with the, the, the Roy Moore thing. I'll do a 10-second riff because I'm only people hanging on it. If you look at Roy Moore not as a pedophile – but as a 30-something-year-old born-again Christian who'd been at, in the military and stuff like that and now is trying to find a wife who's a virgin. And you're not going to find many 30-year-old virgins. The people he was looking for were younger. And right. that explains all of his behavior. And I'm not just saying it to justify anything. I'm saying right. it explains his behavior. Pedophiles sure. usually keep being pedophiles and right and that's i and a, a friend of mine put it and the, even the way he acted during the encounter so i look at that and i'm not part of that i never defended more i said that this is a credible accusation he needs to address it by the way if he'd given the explanation that i just gave if he said i'm going to explain it to you the voters of alabama still would have voted him in if he'd said mm-hmm. look different time i wouldn't you know blah 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 but i could come back i was looking for a wife and nothing happened, as she said. We went in. She was uncomfortable. I left. Uh, the right. voter, the voters would have gone, gee, it's what you said. Genuineness. The thing he screwed up there was he started lying and smearing her, and that did not need to happen. And mm. as, 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 as a Christian, that didn't need to happen. He should, right. should have just said they would have forgiven him if they told him the truth. They wouldn't have even right. forgiven. They would have gone, I get it. I get it. And they would have still voted for him, but he decided not to be genuine, and uh, and so and, and and right now that is a death knell in this yeah. um, in, in this political environment. People are searching for authenticity. This is why I don't have very many worries about the about the millennials. By the way, millennials are all on a search for authenticity, farm to food, natural fibers, all of this stuff. Yeah, it's, yeah. They're, they're they're all that's that they are searching for authenticity and a world of airsats. Um, a verse ersatz um, um, sincerity. They yeah. see through all the lies. They see the wizard behind the curtain. They're like, you guys are all full of shit. Now they're young yet, so yeah, a lot of them skew um, lib, but that's normal. As they get older, and you like sit down and you talk to them, they all start, and they all, and they're all far more educated about libertarian theory at twenty five than I was. Yeah. Right, and I'm like Mr. Libertarian now, right? And everybody calls me Mr. Libertarian. I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever, fine. I, at 25, I was, you know, I was playing freaking Magic the Gathering for Christ's sake. That's what I was right, doing. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, let's not kid ourselves. Actually, I was really playing an, a, a, an even, an even more esoteric game than that. But which one? That, uh, Shadow Fist. 
Okay. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I was actually a world championship, Super Bowl champion tennis really? player at one point. Really? Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, is it so, another card game that I take? It? I don't. I'm not. Yeah, it was, like, it was another card game. You can't, it, it's just a, it's another one of those. This another one of those things. Don't don't. We talk. We can talk about that in another in another one. I, and but at another time. But, See, yeah, I'm, all, I'm more other, of an RPG. Think, I'm more of an RPG. But I'm more of a tunnels and trolls and Dungeons and Dragons, Steve Jackson games. I, 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 if you want to, get to digress into that for the last 10 or 10 or 12 minutes, I'm happy to do. But yeah, I mean, I, I collect esoteric role playing games. Yeah. Um, I don't actually play them. Right. I just collect them as rule sets and books to have to, to think about. And while I, I my, my big thing today is I'm I spend most of my time free time playing board games right now. So that's really where I am. We're in the golden age of board gaming. Um, which I think is a uh, one of those things that we we crave the kind of real together social interaction that we can't get um, from even online gaming. While that's good, getting together with three guys with three people, be they guys or gals, and sitting around a table and playing some you know even vaguely dry German Euro board game is still a wonderfully life affirming experience. Well, and, and it's very it's very hard for me to look at. I I see the RPGs on the computer now. And yeah. I, I was at one, and I really only had one uh, transcendent moment in gaming, which is I was at a con in like 1980, and I was playing a game of Tunnels and Trolls that was DM'd by Mike Stackpole. Now, Mike Stackpole went Wow, on. yeah, I know who Mike Stackpole is. Okay, right, so you know who he is. He's written a lot of the Star Wars mm-hmm. books and everything. But at the time, it was just Mike Stackpole, Stackpole and his wife Liz was there. And I'd known them a little bit because I was a big fan. I was a kid. You know, I was like 15. But, right. dude, that guy is a storyteller. I'm not telling you anything. Right. So this is like saying I was DM'd a game by Charles Dickens. You know what I mean? Like okay. it's, no, it's Okay, like, ready? No, I got one better for you. Ready? I'm going to – I I hate to do this to you, but I'm going to win. Ready? Have you ever read the Amber novels by Roger Zelazny? Yeah, I know Zelazny. Sure. Yeah, I haven't read okay, the novels. Okay, no Zelazny. If you've yeah. not read Amber, dude, you need to read Amber. That's I, that's like your homework for the weekend. So the Amber Diceless role-playing game is one of the is one of the touchstones of 90s or 80s 90s uh, early 90s uh, role playing games it's if you've amber it was the first truly diceless role playing game system and it was perfect for amber yeah and and Eric Wujic the who created the palladium system and and a variety of others his that was his that was his big game and I went to a Dragon Con in like 1989 1990 and we got and we did a game of amber diceless with him 25 people with the attribute auction and the whole nine people who hadn't read the books and the whole uh, beautiful and you want yeah. to talk about things that happened that night we still talk about that game that day yeah. my friend larry was involved in that game did not know anything and it was it just kind of worked itself out too seriously and then uh, yeah i mean well, that game that, has that game has so much history in, in terms of what in terms of role-playing game design today well that's, we see it so. That, that, no, it's a great example of uh, the same thing. It's a transcendent gaming moment that you literally right. can't have in Baldur's Gate or whatever. It's not. Right. It's not possible. You, no, right? you can't. I mean, we had great times in World of Warcraft where we you know, we were we were down in twenty. You know, you, you get forty people into a room together and and clear and and, and down. Yeah, you know, Ragnaros first time. That's a that's a big achievement, and you just just the uh, coordinating, just the work that would take to coordinate yeah. forty for people. And you get uh, you get have fun, but it's almost like it's the same way that video games, as immersive and amazing as they can be now, uh, aren't the things you think of that were like life ch- ch- changing. Like it's still no. film scenes or songs. Does that oh, make yeah, sense? Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. and and so they can be much it's more immersive. People. But it's and right. It's it, it's like you say. It's a human connection. That's why the Sackville thing was just amazing because it was pure storytelling. I don't yeah, remember any. Story. It was pure. The guy was just telling the story. And well, it, got, it got to a point. It got to a point during when we were we were, did so much amber diceless, and I had a friend of mine. Um, my friend, I have a great friend of mine down in South Florida named Ben, and who's who is like the biggest amber, one of the biggest amber geeks in the world. So Ben would run the game, and. It was all storytelling. Remember, no dice. Yeah, we would yeah, just like yeah. show up with four our four stats, two powers, or whatever we had, and then just kind of like sit there and just get into character and la- effectively LARP for four hours. That's right. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And I mean, and I'm not much of an actor, right? But um, you know, and, and we even uh, just do like, some of the things that we used to do, and we still have memories from those games. I will interact every once in a while if I actually get on Facebook, interact with Ben, and he'll just kind of look at me and go, "Dude." 
my name's Lorax and I'm a spy for Amber. And we both just freaking do, we just both lose it because there's this great story that we had, you know, this great moment in one of, in one of our games that is still there. And it's that connection that we'll never lose. And, you know, I, I talked to Ben for 10 years, but we bring that up. We look at each other and we go, yeah, hi, my name is Lorax and I'm a spy for Amber. And because it was the dumbest moment ever, right? It was, I was the worst spy in the court of chaos, courts of chaos for a guy ever. Right. So we just like they just gave me a pin that said, you know, hi, I'm you know, my, with a name tag on it. And it was just funny and it was just brilliant. It's just one of those things. So and it's the th- kind of thing that builds relationships forever. It's the kind of things that build your your friendships forever. And it's something that we all need and crave. Yeah. And, and it's hard. And, to do, and, it's hard to do online. It's just it's, it's, oh, it really is. It's very difficult to do online. It's part of the reason why I wanted to actually sit down and talk to you in a long term, long format today. And we've gone far longer than I expected to, but simply because this is the way you and I can really make a connection in a way that we ha- can't do as good as Fault Lines is, and it's a brilliant show. Um, I really wanted to do the longer thing because I did want to talk about some of these other things that are more personal because at the end of the day, we can all do geopolitics and and, and, and that stuff, but at, some, at a certain point, everybody has to – we have to humanize each other to each other yeah, and yeah. to the audience. No, so. I, no, I've always done – I have a podcast called Making the News where I, I do – interviews and i'm going to do that we all should have you i'll have you on, on making the news too i'm picking that up but that but that's where we've uh i try to do that but it's been so you know i you know for me man i spent so much time researching and right. and uh i i moved to dc with a sense of mission on this story and it's not quite all together yet and mm-hmm. it's not doesn't have any traction and I haven't even, it's all my fault because I haven't even really been able to, to lay it out. Uh, but, um, uh, yeah, this is a I story guess, that's bigger than, this is a story that's bigger than you though. You're going to need, you, you yeah. can't, you can't shepherd this one on through on your own because you're going to get no other support. This is one you're just building from the ground up. And I can tell you just watching what I've seen since the Helsinki, um, summit, it's, it's starting to resonate. What's ha- what's and happening per- is there's there's there's, there's people who get por- parts of it, and those people usually get those parts better than I do, but mm-hmm. the whole big picture there's like nobody who I know who gets the whole thing that's going on here, right. uh, and and the problem is I'm not I don't know the whole thing either, and when I think I do, like I didn't know who Kordakovsky was. I mean I sort of knew, but not really four months ago. Uh, then when right. I when I hit that vein of research, it was like aha, this explains that. A lot See, I of- knew who Kordakovsky was, and I knew the whole story about Yukos, but I didn't know Browder. Right, and you didn't, right. and you probably didn't know he he funded the Magnitsky Act. He's the yeah, guy yeah, who I didn't pay for right. the lobbying. I right, I didn't know any of that stuff. I just remember all of my people, all of my subscribers, going nuts after Helsinki. When Putin mentioned Browder, and they're right. all like, "Dude, he mentioned Browder." I'm like, "What are you guys?" T-? I, I I couldn't say it, but I, I'm yeah. gonna, I, I'll I'll bet you all now. I didn't know what the hell you were talking about. Right. And then I just spent the next week, you know, going over it and going over it and trying to get up to speed quickly. And they go, "Oh shit, this is enormous." And then yes, once you really start to, and then I was able to see the threads of it through all the stuff that I've been looking at at other levels, and it's all everywhere. And I'm That's, sorry, this whole thing is, is, is part of the steel doc. It's, it's all, and it's, dude, it's I'm at the point now yeah. where I firmly believe it's all MI6. And it's all, I well, believe it's all the Brits. No, it's, well, the Brits are a huge, a huge part of it. And see that, and, and that's why it's the Atlantic Council. And that's why yes. often when I end up telling the story right now, I start with Cecil Rhodes. And the reason I do. Wow. And the it's reason really I. Like decade all right right so the reason i do is because it's if you're going to understand soros right mm-hmm. you need to understand the world of ngos you need to understand the world of civil society right and mm-hmm. soros didn't invent that okay in the in the 1950s 53 there was the reese commission in, in congress which was studying the effect of these philanthropies and endowments like the ford Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, which of course still exists today, right? So what Soros did was he took, he saw what other people were doing, right? And he took it to the next level. 
But all the seeds were there with these philanthropies, and all of that goes back to right. uh, Cecil Rhodes and Milner's kindergarten and and all that. And and mm-hmm. when you when you at least get the fact that there was in fact a distinct plan to reunite U- the United States and England, who had been enemies up to that point, right? It's it, people forget that. In world in in the Civil War, they were on the side of the Confederacy. The Confederate right. Navy was built in Liverpool. People forget that. So at the, at the and they and people also forget that the Russians were uh, were in on our help, side. Came in on the side, right? Peter That's, the Great supported the Union. So the so the British Empire is falling apart, and so they realize that the United States is not going away, and they're worried because the the empire is leaving so what do they need to do we need the resources of the u.s we need to be friends with them again we need to start to hook up the relationship again and that's exactly what cecil rhodes did meantime they're colonizing south africa and creating de beers and de beers as a completely artificial monopoly that was made up Mm -hmm. is a sort of a perfect example of elitism fake capitalism that they promoted for years so i like to i that's why rhodes brings it up then of course rhodes connects to uh, the Rhodes Scholarship, which sends Clinton to Oxford, which is right. coincidental, except kind of, because the guy who reported all this, Carol Quigley, uh, Carol Quigley was a, a Georgetown professor who really right. mapped out all the stuff I'm talking about with Cecil Rhodes. Bill Clinton, in his acceptance speech at the DNC, mentions Kennedy and Carol Quigley, <laughs> who was his mentor at Georgetown. So Clinton, right. a very smart guy, I think, look, he, he knew this history, right? And he's mm-hmm. figured out how to implement it, right? He understands how these civil society groups, these philanthropic groups, these oligarchs, governments all work to, and the media, because don't forget the other big guy who was part of the, that early group, uh, uh, that Quigley talked about was W.T. Stead, who's the father of modern journalism, who right. died, died, died under the Titanic. Stead, sets the media thing. They realize that the way to affect things is to affect you you control consensus of people through the media. And they built up a war machine. They got us into World War One through fake news. They're doing exactly what they did in Russia to, mm-hmm. today. They did to the Germans in World War One to the build mm-hmm. up to World War One. They did it just to build a big British weapons industry. World War Two comes, the, the United States goes yeah, it seems to be a good business. So suddenly we get the military-industrial complex. But it's all the same people that connect back to this roundtable group, which, they're again, it's in their own words. This Out of that, you get Chatham House in England. You get the Council of Foreign Relations here. And these are still mm-hmm. the people who run things. And that's why I say this is why I say the elitist. When I mean the elitist, it's like this group of people who are now represented by the neocons and other people, but if you just I like look, to call them I like to call them the Davos crowd now. It is. And and right. it's and it's valid. And by the way, it's exactly uh, the reason I bring up Stead and the media techniques, all Bill Browder's doing, all he's doing is applying the same techniques, which right. is you create a media narrative that affects the market. He's talked about this. Yes. He's, if if I want to change the value of a company Right. What's going mm-hmm. to do more, a patent sale or a New York Times story? Right. right. And the oh, yeah, end- no, especially especially today, where all of the world with the high frequency trading is all where the algorithms are all scanning the headlines on a regular on a day to day basis. You can do whatever you want by, by manipulating the headlines. Hell, the central banks are doing the central banks do this on a day, day, right. daily basis. And Browder- I mean, this is what's happening. This is what's happening in, in with between the ECB and. Italy right now. Did like you, every day, someone else is coming out and moving the markets by 20 points. Have you read the the uh, paper by a, a, a Canadian professor that quotes Bill Browder extensively talking about his techniques? This is before the Magnitsky thing blew up at all. No, right? I haven't read it. No. Oh, my God. It's the most fascinating document you'll ever read, knowing what you know about Browder. About four pages of it are the most mm-hmm. fascinating thing. Browder lays out exactly what he's done. He says... We were when he says you know investor advocate, he'd say we go in, we create these media stories. I learned to tell the story. I learned you got to keep it really simple. You just repeat the same things. He's revealing exactly what he does now, and this right. was years before. And 
once you look at it, you go, well, yeah, you didn't invent this. This is what elites do. Mm -hmm. They manipulate the public and the markets and everything else. They use the media to do it. They use the government to do it. They use civil society to do it. And at the end of the day, they don't care about capitalism or socialism or any of that. (laughs) It's... It's all. It's all about power. It's all. It's, it's all just about power. Yep. And, and 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 then they and then you know and every day that they do something like that, they make enough money to then, to then fuel their operations for the next three weeks, and then they you know create another one, and the thing just keeps going. I I know that Soros believes fundamentally that he's got enough money that he and it's a self sustaining thing that you know, eighteen billion dollars goes to OSF right, Open Society Foundation. You know, invested reasonably, eighteen billion dollars is going to throw off. A billion dollars a year in in in, in revenue, right? Because I mean, five percent on eighteen billion dollars is like four point nine billion. Uh, you know, is is you know is nine hundred fifty million dollars a year. Well, right? see, but here's what's working against. So that. I mean, that, that's your that's that, I mean that's your endowment. I mean that that's your operating that's opex. If you're not even that's your operating budget before you even hit your um hit your budget. So, but here's yeah, before the, you even hit your seed corn. So here's the, here's the here's the fatal flaw in their plan, and I think they're aware of it, and this is why they're getting so desperate. Mm-hmm. The, the flaw with it is, uh, I saw a good speech by somebody that started with them saying, a lot of people say, well, the government doesn't care about what I think. They don't care about what I think, and he's like, no, all they care about is what you think. They spend. There are people who spend all mm-hmm. day just trying to determine the content of your head. All they care right. about is what you think. Uh, here, here's a question, and look for this. Maybe I'm missing one. I have seen people who fell for Bill Browder's story, who then turned and realized the truth, and are now anti Bill Browder. Right? right. I have found no one who was anti Bill Browder, who then learned more, and suddenly became pro Bill Browder. I have found right. not one person. I've ever met ever who's like, you know, I used to, I, cause whatever you do, you find people, oh, you know, I used to be a, a Mormon or whatever you are. That doesn't right. make any difference, right? So right. I, I used to be a Christian scientist and then whatever. Okay. So I, I you've never found anyone because, you know, I used to think Bill Browder was lying about this entire story, but then I saw the truth <laughs> and I realized that there Bill Browder. There ain't Browder's, that many sci- there ain't that many ciphers, right? right? The guys who jack out of the matrix and then know the stake right. is bullshit and still wants to go back. That's right. right. No one wants to go back. What? You know, once you're once you're red pilled, once you're out, of, once you're out, you can't unsee what you've seen. And that's the end of part two. Thank you very much for listening. We'll have part three out later in the week. Take care. And keep your stick on the ice.